joining us as a president of Indiana section of the uh, AADR this year. So I would like to welcome everyone to the research day at USD on the virtual section on the year of 2021. So as we all know about the COVID-19 pandemic situation, so even though we might see some hope with the vaccine, with the treatment, however, we still have a ways to go. But on the other hand, on the research side, we cannot stop creating and researching and innovation for, especially for the oral health. So the research day organizing committee have come up with this hybrid format of the research day. Now we we hosting the virtual section of the research day, which we will have our guest speaker, Dr. Arunho, the chief scientist at the ADA. He will talk up to us about the COVID and the research world and in dentistry. However, on the outside of around the dental school, we have the poster display on the first floor at uh, the lobby area on the main street, uh, as well as on the third floor at the, at the bridge that connect between the Fritz building and the old building. So something very special about this poster is if you look closely to the bottom of the poster, you see a QR code for each poster. <clears throat> Using your smartphone, scan that code. There will be a four to seven minute video for each project, the presenter for each poster recording their presentation. So it, when you go um, walk around, you scan that, it seems like the poster talk to you. So it gives us a feeling of the hybrid event, not just everything dry online. I think some of you may already, you know, seen that. And to make the research day event live, this live event more exciting. So I would like to introduce, you know, my student co-host, Ms. Uh, Drashni Modi. She's a second year dental student. She's a vice president of the student research group and also the recipient of the NIH research scholar. So please welcome Drashni. Drashni. Thank you so much, Dr. Fasuk, for the wonderful introduction. And good afternoon, everybody. Like Dr. Fasuk mentioned, my name is Drashni Modi. I'm currently a second year dental student at Indiana University School of Dentistry. And it is my utmost honor to be able to co-host this research day event with Dr. Fasuk at my side. So when I was first offered the opportunity to host this event with Dr. Fasuk, both of us were going back and forth on how do we shake things up a little bit for this newly hybrid way of research symposium? So I came up with my best shot at this approach. So hear me out. You might have heard Shakespeare parodies. And if you are an ultimate science nerd like me, you have definitely Googled or YouTube science parody songs, right? So today on this research day, we combine Shakespeare and science and it goes something like this. You are ready for this? Okay, 69 posters, each unalike in dental goals, in fair IUSD, where we lay our scene, where novel patient needs motivates our souls, while our scholars work hard to balance lab work and mental health as a well-oiled machine. From forth the petri dishes full of oral bacteria, several students gather their samples and run to the microscopes. Some juggle imaging modalities and different appliances for other tissue criteria, all while hoping that their experimental designs brighten their patients' hopes. Do with their new resins, CBCT images and data and aligners capture our attention. Celebrating and sharing their knowledge is this research day's intention. The which, if you with patient ears attend, what here shall miss, the posters in the main street hallway and the third floor will strive to mend. So if anybody can guess what play we adapted this from, you will get a free air hug from yours truly. With that in mind, welcome everybody to our annual Student Research Day 2021. And today we aim to celebrate the successes of research in this past year. And we also want to know more about the brewing curiosities at our building. If you are a social media fan like I am, definitely feel free to take snaps of the webinar today and post them with the hashtag wanna know more. With that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Fasuk to introduce our first speaker. 
Okay, thank you, Drashni. That is very energetic. Thank you so much. So next, I would like to welcome our dean, Dr. Carol and Murdoch Kinch, to share her welcome remark for the research day. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Pusuk. Um, welcome to the 29th annual Indiana University School of Dentistry Research Day keynote presentation and award ceremony. We are extremely proud of our longstanding traditions of excellence in research and discovery here at IUSD. Being the only dental school in Indiana and a core school of Indiana University, a top tier world-class public research university. Science is also the foundation of the dental profession. Scholarship of all types and the search for truth and new knowledge is at the heart of our entire mission at IUSD to advance the oral health of the people of the state of Indiana and around the world through excellence in education, patient care, research, and community engagement. When students participate in research and other forms of scholarship, it not only enhances their education by exposing them to the thrill of discovery of new knowledge, but also provides opportunities for them to learn how to communicate and disseminate scientific knowledge through presentations and publications. For most of our student investigators, this experience serves to deepen their understanding of the scientific method and the science foundation of dentistry, so to enrich their clinical decision-making in patient care. But for others, this will ignite a passion for an alternative career path in dentistry to impact the world through oral health research. We are so proud of the fine work that our students, faculty, and staff have presented this year. Research Day is the one day every year that we pause to showcase our science and celebrate excellence in research and its impact on oral health. Our research enterprise hibernated for several months in 2020, but today's poster presentations showcase all that has been accomplished despite this setback. Congratulations to all of our investigators. This year, more than ever, it is especially appropriate to pause and think about and be grateful for the impact of research and innovation on our everyday world. In this past year, amazing progress has been made in the fight against the COVID-19 pandemic through research and scientific discovery. Our ever-changing knowledge of the SARS-CoV-2 virus and its modes of transmission and its myriad effects, the development of rapid and accurate tests and multiple highly efficacious and safe vaccines. These are all the results of transformational collaborative research that built upon the work of scientists over the past century, but could only be made possible with the tools of today. And this is just the beginning. Science and discovery are the path forward to the future we create. I look forward to our keynote presentation and the presentation of our awards that follows. Please enjoy our research day keynote address. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Murdoch Kinch. So and next in, uh, in our agenda is uh, updating in research uh, from Dr. Gabriel Shu, our Associate Dean for Research. Hi, everyone. I would like to welcome you again to our 2021 annual Indiana University School of Dentistry Research Day. My name is Tim and Gabriel Chu. I'm the Associate Dean for Research. Now, this is the second year we're hosting our research day using an online or virtual format. Looking back, this has been quite a year since March 2020. Because of the pandemic, we have hibernated all our research activities except for a few essential research projects since March until all the way to July. And in August, we start to bring back our research on a limited capacity basis. But despite all the restrictions and limitations, we continue to engage our students in research 
as you can see from this slide, the total number of abstracts submitted to our research day since 2016, for this year, we're able to maintain the similar level to what we have in 2017 and 2018. The color coding just show the contribution from different student groups. You can see that most contributions are from our master's students, followed by DDS students, dental hygiene students, and others. This is a slide showing our DDS student engagement in research by the numbers. Since 2016, we have about 10 students receiving research fellowships, about 28 to 11 students present in IUSD research days, and several students receiving research honors at their graduation, and a few students are listed as co-author in their faculty's research publications. Now, these are all good, but we'd like to see more, we'd like to see more engagement from the dental students. Uh, as you know that this year's research fellowship deadline is April the 16th. So you still have the opportunity to do research. Uh, you can check with Dr. Brzezniti if you want to do so. I would like to use this opportunity to highlight some of the research accomplishments of from our students. As many of you know that our D3 student, Ashley Kachowski, was awarded a prestigious Fogarty Fellowship from NIH in 2019 and went to Kenya to study periodontal disease in HIV positive adolescents. And she is now uh, elected as the vice president of AADR National Student Research Group and will be serving in that capacity in this coming year. The co-host for today's event, Drash D. Modi, our D2 students, has just been selected to the NIH Medical Research Scholars Program. This program will allow her to spend one year at NIH under a mentor to conduct research on the NIH campus. This is a very competitive program. They accept only less than 40 scholars each year from all applicants from School of Medicine, School of uh, Dentistry, and School of Veterinary Science. And Drashti is the first ever IUS student student that has been accepted to this research program. Now, one of the important foundation to the success of our students is our faculty. In this past year, our faculty also have been recognized in various ways in their research achievement. In this last year, Dr. Dom Zero was awarded the William Guys Award by AADR for the best paper in Journal of Dental Research in the clinical research category for his role as a co-author on a paper titled Non-Restorative Treatment for Caries, Systematic Review and Network Meta-Analysis. In this past year, Dr. Mythiti Srinivasan received her third U.S. patent uh, titled Peptides and Methods for Treatment of Neurodegenerative Diseases. The patent addresses the use of second-generation peptide analog to suppress chronic inflammation in neurodegenerative diseases. We also have faculty receiving new NIH grants in this past year. Dr. Anderson Hara received his UG3 grant uh, titled Erosive toothwear perception among network dentists and patients and experience among network patients. Dr. Yasuyoshi Weki received his R21 uh, with the title of characterization of OGFRL1 knockout mice. And I hope you all feel as proud as I am about the research at IUSD. Finally, for this year, we are honored to have Dr. Arujo from ADA to be our keynote speaker. And I'll let Dr. Duarte to introduce him in a few minutes. I do hope you enjoy today's research presentation and the rest of the program. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm thrilled to introduce Dr. Araujo. Dr. Araujo is the Chief Executive Officer for the ADA Science and Research Institute, as well as the ADA Chief Science Officer. Over his 20 plus years of experience in research and epidemiology, I would probably take the entire research day event just to list all his accomplishments. So I'll try to point out the ones that excite me the most. Dr. Araujo has a very impressive leadership in dental sciences. 
filling the unfortunate gap that exists between basic sciences and the actual dental office. By doing that, he helps us scientists deliver our research to what dentists will actually use as therapists and guides dentists to understand how they can apply evidence-based dentistry in their treatment plans. Dr. Araujo holds a DDS degree and a license to practice as a periodontist. He worked as a clinician in the beginning of his career, moving to academia right after. He translated to industry in the beginning of 2000s, working at companies like Pfizer and J&J. &J. And in 2015, he joined ADA as a vice president of the Science Institute and has been in the institution since then. In addition to being inspired by his career, Marcelo and I are very good friends. We are both from Brazil, but we actually met many months ago while he was still working at j, j in New Jersey, where I was invited to give a lecture on biofilms. And lately we are constantly sharing experiences of proud puppy parents. I'm very excited he accepted our invitation to talk to you guys, and I'm sure you will find his talk fascinating. My hope is that you feel inspired to learn all the things dentists can do in the research field. Thank you again, Dr. Araujo. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Duarte. It's a pleasure for me to be here uh, with all of you in Indiana. Uh, we are so close, but so far. It's a, it's a shame that we cannot be together today. So I'm hoping that uh, you guys can take advantage of this conversation and uh, learn a little bit more about what we're doing here in, uh, in the ADA. Uh, can I share my screen? I I'm I'm, think so. <laughs> I'm burning calories. Okay. So what I have for you today is a little bit of uh, the idea of what we can do in, when you're talking about science used for uh, develop policy, but then most importantly is to see, look at how science can help clinicians make decisions. My main objective, I think always when we do research at the ADA is to always have a final answer for clinicians. I usually tell my friend and my, my staff and my group here said, I don't wanna see a paper being published where the final sentence is. More research has to be done in this area to answer that question. We need to find the best that we can do to help our members. Over 160,000 members, a lot of them are in the audience today, including all dental students who are members of the ADA. So I hope I can give you a little bit of flavor of everything we do. I have a lot of slides. I'm gonna try to run through them very quickly, but I didn't wanna miss any opportunity to share anything. Um, I wanna also make, um, special acknowledgement to Dr. Uh, uh, Jeff Blatt, who has been a great partner of us here when he was a chair of a Council of Scientific Affairs, as well as now as a, a ADA volunteers that representing us at FDI committee, but also doing the work that he and I have done in the past, few publications down and everything. So I just want to do a shout out to Jeff. So I just want to remind you as ADA member, you need to know that we are science-based, uh, science and evidence-based uh, organization. We do what we do because we wanna make sure the clinicians make decisions based on science and not making decisions just because, for instance, they read on Facebook, right? We love Facebook, we love social media, but we know really well uh, that that's not the right way for us to get our evidence. The goals today are trying to put a lot in here, but I would just say one thing. We develop data, we develop science to make sure that we are able to help the clinicians understand what they have to do when treating patients. And I'm gonna give you a little flavor of what we do in dental materials, what we do in scientific information, what we do in EBD, and a little bit at the end of COVID data. And actually it's my pleasure, I was telling Simone over the weekend, you're the first one to see the, the data that was just accepted by JADO in our six months publication for um, the incidence of COVID among dentists. So that would be my final part. So what is the ADA SRI? ADA SRI is a science-focused 
subsidiary of the America Dental Association. We were created at the end of 2019, beginning of 2020, uh, when the ADA decided to move all the work that we did on the Science Institute of the ADA together with the work that it was done before on the foundation to then create a new subsidiary. Our mission is to improving lives through oral health science and research. And we look into very different things that we do to uh, uh, help our members succeed. So I did a bit of taste of the SRI. There are five departments within the SRI. Innovation Technology is based in Maryland. This is the group uh, led by Dr. Nick Hammond and has a lot of uh, the work that we do in terms of creating patents and creating new technology, things that you're probably not gonna see at the dental school and your clinical practice from like 10, 15 years from now. I don't know if you knew, but um, was the group in Maryland that actually create the resin composite, was the group in Maryland that actually created the panoramic x-rays and also a lot of other things that we use nowadays uh, in, in our dental practice. We have the work with the research laboratories. I'm gonna show some of the data they do. You know them well because of standards, also because of the ADL seal of acceptance. You think uh, the work done by the EBD and science information group on the clinical practice guidelines, um, as well as the work that we do for the scientific information supporting some of federal agencies. We also have a governance piece and operation piece of the Institute. This is a little bit I wanted you to see there is like, I am very proud of this 57 people that work with us and we are able to actually develop a lot of work that you probably see on the website, on the publications in JADA, et cetera. So I'm gonna give you a little bit of flavor of what we do. I'm not gonna be able to give because of the time details, but I'll be happy to answer questions later on so you understand. So Perna Gopal is our dentist microbiologist and her lab is focusing two things, microbiology and chemistry. There are two arms of her lab. I'm gonna give you a little flavor of what we do. For instance, in the past, when actually Dr. Platt was the chair of uh, CSA, we enter on this area of cleanliness. The FDA came up with new rules that talked about how uh, the clinicians will have to use some of the devices once and then throw in the trash because there was no information on how to clean and how to sterilize. So we developed now a new standard to look into the cleanliness of some of dental, dental devices such as birth and implant um, devices. We also look into the seal products as well as development of other uh, representing the, the, the ADA at the ADA NC meetings. So if you don't know what ADA NC is, is the American National, or is the Agency for National Standards Information. So the current projects that we have, Perna and her group are, really, are now currently developing a multi-species oral biofilm model. It's a very different from what we see in other places because this model is specific for the use and test of some of the work that we do for the seal product. We also look into other things related to biofilm, specifically to biofilm uh, growth around dental materials. Um, and uh, her group is looking to biofilm and how biofilm form around zirconia. Zirconia has a, been a major focus for us, for our lab, because of the amount of work and the amount of uh, use of zirconia among our members. There's a lot of questions that I think now is the number one uh, question that we get from our members. If you read it with Jada, and then we have the Jada corner, last year, the end of the year, we had an ACE panel report on zirconia that has been, actually was the number three most download publication on Jada last year. So zirconia is very popular about this. So we have a whole line of research, which I'm gonna touch a little bit later on, uh, on the presentation. In chemistry, there are very, three different areas that we are focusing in uh, under Perna, Christina Tarkowski, she leads this lab. And one is the heavy metals testing for, for the standards and for the seal. Charcoal toothpaste and tooth powders is something that we get a lot of questions about from our members and from the public. We know that they're very abrasive. So we are trying to look and identify some of the issues that you can find on, this, on these products. And also we are developing now the focus on oral malfrains. We're developing now new methodology for development standards focused on CPC malfrains, chlorexidine, as well as essential oils. So as you can see, the group is touched very different things. 
um, in the in the area of um, products that are available for our patients. On the seal of acceptance, I, I would like to talk about a little bit of what we do. We talk about the fluoride release methods, which is very controversial. Each company comes up with a different way. And I think Dr. Zero will agree with me that it's I still, after so many years, there's not yet an agreement which one is the right method to use. We can go on and on and talk about fluoride release and the uptake of fluoride, and it's still not there. We also looking before, besides the regular fluoride uptake, we also talk about stainless fluoride and how it affects uh, uh, the biofilm as well as the availability of fluoride within the biofilm. Uh, other things that we're doing is I talk a little bit about oral mouth rinse and on the device area, a lot of the work on the seal is done to test toothbrush, dental floss and other things. I don't wanna miss the opportunity also to talk about what we're also doing in terms of uh, developing of a seal certificate for the testing labs. And I'm proud to say that we have been partnered with Indiana and Anderson Hara and the group, and they, they are part of the program. They have gone through the, the audit and I'm, I'm, I'm very happy with the partnership that we create because benefits not just also our members, but as well as uh, the university. And it, it makes it much easier for us to talk to the companies, especially the small ones, where they should go to do good research. And I think Anderson uh, and the group has been doing a lot of great work uh, together with James Palmer and her group on this. I talk a little bit about what we talk about in the lab in terms of zirconia. So Spiro McGramis is a great scientist. He's an engineer PhD, and he has been with the ADA for over 20 years. Some of you in dental materials know Spiro really well. Um, some of the work that he's doing nowadays is really focused on twofold. One, it's uh, developing standards for orthodontics as well as the dental materials substitutes, not just for dental composite, but, as what, uh, but also for zirconia and other things. All this focus on the fact that we are going through a amalgam phase down in the US. Um, amalgam is a, is a product that is still used, especially in low-income countries, but you will be surprised how many people still use amalgam in the US. We have a paper that we submitted to the Journal of Public Health Dentistry, and we have shown that at least 53% 50 of the US population still have amalgam in their mouth. It's not about just using amalgam, but when you're removing amalgam and where the amalgam is gonna go. And where, when you remove the amalgam, what are you gonna use as a substitute? So Spiro does a lot of work in that area. So here's a little bit of the example. So. Uh, one of the things we're looking is uh, standards and development standards for uh, uh, clear liners, right? So you know uh, Invisalign and you know some of the things that are coming out and being sold to our, to our patients over the internet. And we need to figure out what are the good products and what are not the good products. What is safe? About the, the goal of developing standards is always about safety for the patients. So we got into this a few years ago and we are now finalizing the technical report through ADA AMC. And hopefully soon we will be able to come up with a new standard that will define what the manufacturers need to do to have a product that really fits something that we can consider safe. Uh, so we are close to the publication. You will see some of this data being published actually uh, as an abstract first and yeah, during the IADR, IADR meeting. Unfortunately, it will be virtual, so we're not gonna be able to be together, but there will be presentations on this. I talked a little bit about zirconia. Don't ask me a question about this. I'm a periodontist, but I love the pictures that they come. I love to see the work that the team is doing. Spear is the person you can contact to ask, but I wanna show a little bit about what it is that we are doing to help our members understand why should use, they should use zirconia. And when they choose zirconia between the three Y and the five Y, what are the characteristics that they need to look for and how they need to do, what they need to do for adjusting, finishing, polishing to have a, a, a final crown on onlay inlay that really looks good uh, as Zirconia provides to their members. So some of the work that Spiro and his group is doing. Okay, so with that, we move them from the lab 
into the clinical relevance. And uh, years ago, we had something called the Professional Product Review, which was referred as the PPR. And the PPR over the years, if they revolve and they transform. And we look into how can we help our members understand what it is clinical insights based on the opinion of them, their peers. We understand that the thing that dentists trust the most is not the science that they hear from the manufacturers. It's not the science that they sometimes hear on the lecture, but they wanna hear. Once they learn about that science, how are their peers, how are their colleagues using such products? I'm gonna use the latest version of this panel. You can find this in the latest publication on JADA. It's online, it's available for everybody. It's on the April issue of JADA. And this is the last one that we published and it's called, it's focused on the treatment of the defective restoration. Should you repair, replace? Right? That's a question that now has been uh, in the mind of a lot of people. When I went to the dental school, everything was replaced. I didn't have the dental materials that you have in your hands right now, and you wouldn't want me to replace and do anything in terms of uh, restorative dentistry these days. But I think we had a group of experts here that really, really helped us understand. So this was led by Dr. Juliana da Costa. She is a professor and vice chair of the Department of Restorative Dentistry in Oregon. And you can see the other members of the panel. Olivia Court is the staff person who leads this group uh, together with the volunteers. So the goal here was to understand for them, from the members what they do when there is an issue with uh, res restorations in the patient's mouth. And we ask questions, the survey, and you can, as a member, you can all join and uh, participate on those surveys. So our members told that one third of them said they do not repair amalgam or glass ionomer or fracture, uh, fracture, flat, fracture interact ceramic crowns. 98% they repair resin composites. So we see that difference, right? So we understand that people are most likely to direct to repair composite than any other. And you can see here the three other things, what they take into consideration when they need to repair or when they need to uh, replace a, a restoration. So you, you look into the caries, you look into see if there is any fracture, and they also look into the margins of the crown. When they look into those three factors, then they make the decision. And then when they make the decision if they should repair those materials, what do they use? And as you can see here, we look into glass ionomer, amalgam, and direct resin, resin composite. And you can see here by the numbers, for instance, when the, the original restoration was glass ionomer, what did they use, uh, so on and so forth. So I think this is very important because it helps each, uh, everybody to see what their peers are doing. We don't do this based on the product. We don't know if it is a product from company A or company B. We just talk about it, the device overall. And I'm not gonna get into detail here. And then they use, but I want you to see here, what else do they need to do uh, to treat the surface, the surface of these uh, restorations um, and so on and so forth. If you go on to the, to the full report on JADA, you will see the, the information. So the conclusion are that many dentists are actually making restoration repairs instead of replacing, which is good because we know when you remove completely a restoration, the most likely you're gonna have, also you also be moving, removing some sound tooth structure and we don't want this. Uh, we always give a practical implication that repair of this restoration is acceptable. We need to understand that as long as the people follow uh, the instructions on how to use the follow up procedures, probably using a rubber dam, et cetera, you most likely have success. So for those students who are going through the clinics in restorative dentistry, talk to your uh, instructors and your, your professors and learn more about what you can do to repair. Now I'm gonna move forward to something else and uh, getting out the dental materials. We're going to talk a little bit more about what we did in terms of public health influence. And one of the things this project, I, as I said before, I'm a periodontist, I'm not all pathologist, but it's my duty to look into all structures in the mouth, not only the teeth or the gums. And we know the issues related to oral cancer and oral pharyngeal cancer. We know that HPV, human papilloma virus, is the number one uh, cause of oropharyngeal cancer. 
difference from oral cancer. Oral cancer, uh, you will have uh, cigarette smoke, tobacco users, tobacco products, use of alcohol and some other issues that will most likely cause oral cancer and gen genetics, et cetera. While the oral pharyngeal cancer, a lot of the times, 100, almost 100% of the times, it ca it's caused by HPV infection. Yeah? The issue here that we had is that in the last few years, we saw a rise on the incidence of cases of oral pharyngeal cancer among men. Data shows that in 2016, oral pharyngeal cancer among men became the number one type of uh, HPV-related cancer in the United States. While they thought that this was not going to happen until 2022. Prior to that date, for ovarian cancer was the number one uh, type of cancer caused by HPV. Why was that happening? If you think about the time uh, they started vaccinating uh, women during their teenage years, like about 20 years ago, you start preventing HPV related cancer in women. Boys were not vaccinated to HPV until about less than 10, five years ago. And what we see now is the men now at their age 30 and above just uh, developing oral pharyngeal cancer because they were not vaccinated. So we know the HPV vaccination will reduce the infection. It will reduce uh, the, 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 the likelihood that someone will have oral pharyngeal cancer and we needed to do something. So we started an education program with the ADA. We start working uh, with some of our volunteers, Dr. Alessandro Villa, who is now the chair of oral medicine at UCSF, was our main person working with us. Dr. Lauren Patton from UNC also was involved in this program. And what we did was to look into all the literature that we need to provide to our members. As I said at the beginning, the goal of ADA SRI is to create science that will inform people on how they need to treat their patients. So here are the two main publications that we had. One came out uh, last year in JADA 2020. Uh, we came this with a summary of the evidence, uh, but at the, at the same time, we also used the ACE panel to, under, to help the members understand what are they are doing. We have HP ADA policy that really supports the use of vaccine to prevent oral pharyngeal cancer. And with that, we were able to then have this ammunition to create all these other resources for members and for the patients. One of the things is those brochures. The more, the more you think, the patients like this type of brochures, they need to be informed. And this also help us to focus on what we need to do in, in terms of advocacy. The ultimate uh, term of advocacy, power advocacy that we had was going and to the FDA when they opened to the public comments and they were looking to expand the age for HPV vaccination to 45, age 45 for men and women, as well as making the vaccine acceptable and approved for a, as a method to prevent oral pharyngeal cancer before they, it was an off-label use. So we feel very power, uh, empowered by the fact that science informed regulations and science informed policy. And now we can talk about HPV prevention with all the resource that we uh, develop. So this is the, probably the piece that a lot of people have been waiting for. Uh, and this is uh, what we have been doing uh, in terms of COVID uh, prevention. And uh, what we have here is the, I'm gonna go through this data. The data has been published on JADA, as well as on Journal of Dental Hygiene. I'm not gonna show the data from hygiene because of the time, but I, I'm gonna give you a little flavor of what we're doing uh, in, during, since the beginning of last year when we all had uh, this big surprise. You've probably seen what the ADA, did, uh, the ADA resources that we have developed and our first line of development of product or, or information for our members was, what do we do in terms of safety? You probably know this chart. You've probably seen the work that we've done in terms of masks and why you should use a N95, a KN95 versus surgical mask and helping our members to understand what they should do to present, uh, prevent uh, infection in the dental office. This is a very busy slide. This is available uh, to all members on our website. But remember March 2020, when we closed 
uh, we ask everybody to stop seeing patients because we thought dentistry was a very high risk profession. We had to figure out what we were gonna tell you on how to see your patients. So we create this very, look like a very complicated algorithm, but it's actually not because you only have to answer questions. So if you say yes or no to one thing, you just go to the next box and you are used to do until you look into, it's this patient urgent. This was back in April, if you remember this. And we created all these resources and helping our members to make decisions and why, when, and should uh, treat their patients. All the way to define low risk, moderate risk, and moderate high risk, and how to treat the patients. Finally, we talk a little bit about uh, the risk of exposures, what people should be doing, how to prevent among the staff, um, etc. So we did that first because it was the first reaction, the first thing that we had to do to uh, help members and give resource to the members. At the same time, we start generating data. And as an epidemiologist, this opened a huge door for me and to go back into my roots and develop some research and uh, publish uh, some of the work that we're doing. We're very lucky because we partnered with uh, my colleague, Dr. Marco Vujicic, who leads the Health Policy Institute. And he had a panel of about 12,000 dentists. And 12,000 dentists for an epidemiologist is a great source of information. We were able to actually, for the first lab uh, line of research, to get about 4,000 uh, uh, questions to about 4,000 members uh, for our epidemiology part of the, of the panel. So I'm going to show you, you've probably seen this data, but this is the data that we published in November uh, of last year and with our cross-sectional piece of information in looking to the prevalence of COVID-19 among dentists. What we saw, this was this is the first longitudinal study. We don't know to date any other longitudinal study in the US uh, looking to prevalence of COVID among dentists. And also the look, we also, the second aim was to look into what it is that the dentists were doing to prevent uh, infection following the CDC and ADA guidance. Our data showed that, I'm gonna go fast here because I prefer to focus on the six months for you because this is published. Our, our data showed that in June, 21 over about 2,200 dentists were pulled and we show a very low prevalence of COVID-19 among dentists, 0.9%. I wanna make sure that you understand, June was the first month after people went back to work. Before that, dentists were only seeing patients for because of emergency or urgent needs. So we saw that it's very important to understand that you did what you had to do to keep yourself uh, not sick and keep everything safe around you so you could go back to it. So I'm very happy to see 0.9% is a very low uh, prevalence level uh, of, um, of a disease. We saw also the 99% of the dentists were in primary care practice, were enhancing disinfection procedures, were doing the screening, pre-screening teledentistry became a huge thing for us, right? We all talk to our patients now through devices, through smartphones, et cetera, but the use of and wear of face masks uh, became very important more than before we changed to N95 or N95. And we saw the 72.8% of practice data dentists were following exactly what the CDC wanted. And I say that it looks like, why, why not 99%? Because the CDC guidance is very strict. And a lot of people were doing some small, it were not using uh, not seeing patients for aerosol generating procedures. Therefore, we assume that they were using some type of PPE, but not the full uh, range that CDC recommended. So that was the first data. We then enter a partnership with the ADHA to look into the same questions, similar questions for hygienists. And this data was just published on the journal Dental Hygiene online. You can go, it's open access. Uh, for uh, on the February issue. I'm not gonna go into the data, but all I'm gonna tell you here, there were two papers, one on the level of employment, Marco and his group leading this, and my group with Cameron Astridge, we both look focused really on the epidemiology piece. And we saw from this data that dental hygienists, as you can see on the second bar here, had a level 3.1% in the month of October. 
Okay, so accumulative prevalence about dentists by October was at 2% and the, and the amount of uh, prevalence among hygienists was 3.1%. The general population was a little lower, but I, I think the most important piece here is to see that healthcare workers in general, this is a data from New York, was coming up with 11%. So we are considering very, 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 um, safe. When we look into the cumulative prevalence among dentists, we saw a number of about 2.6%, and we did a calculation 3.1 and 2.6 was not statistically significant difference. So we have similar rates among dentists and hygienists for the same time period. So we saw that the key takeaways from this data was 99.1% of the dental practice at that point had availability of PPE. They were using what the way they did. And we think that the, the levels of PPE were a par with the guidance. One of the things I'm not touching today here, I talk about the 3.1%, but one of the things that I wanna highlight here is that throughout this whole time, we've seen a lot of symptoms and increasing symptoms of anxiety and depression among dentists and dental hygienists. And we are working now on the papers to publish this uh, information. Uh, we partnered with Mia Geisinger from Alabama and F. Yonadu from uh, Yukon, and they are working on that piece of the data. Finally, uh, here is the data that nobody's seen yet. So you're the first one. So this is the six months longitudinal data on COVID infection among dentists. And we look again, now we are looking not just the prevalence and the cumulative prevalence, meaning on the course of six months, what is the rate of prevalence? So we expect that to be high. If you remember on the first data was 0 0.9 in June. So you will see this increasing up to the last month. We then look at incidence rate, which is the new cases among dentists. And we also continue to look into the engagement in terms of infection control. I'm not gonna get into this methodology, but you can look into the papers and you will see what it is. Uh, I really wanna get back to the Q&A so we can answer your questions, but here are the results. So when you look into what we ask about the personal protective equipment, the PPE use, you see that the dentist and AGDP aerosol generated dental procedures. So we look into when they were generating aerosol, what were they using? So you can see here that a majority of dentists throughout all the six points were always using mask and eye protection according to the CDC. And they say sometimes were at N95, sometimes they use a um, surgical mask and always were in 95. So you can see that people uh, were really focused on safety here. But I think it's very important to understand that you don't see 100% because for instance, if you're doing something that is not a GDP, aerosol generating procedures, you may not need to use the full uh, PP. Uh, this is very uh, busy slide, but you can see here how the dentist throughout the, the month, you know, each color indicates a month, and you can see it's very consistent for each one of the questions, what they were doing throughout the scene. I wanna highlight teledentistry is still something that can be used and something that can be done. We still have to educate people about uh, how to use effectively tele teledentistry to treat their patients. This is the good data. As I told you, the cumulative prevalence was going to increase. And you can see here on the line graph, at each month we add it we add a new case. So over six months, we were at 2.6% prevalence of COVID-19 among dentists, which is really good. If you remember the data I showed before, 11% on other healthcare professionals. The highest month that we saw was November and we have an incidence, which means new cases in that month of 1.1%. So we feel that our members are doing the right thing. We feel that dentists continue to do the right thing. There's no statistical significant difference between the, the months. We see that everything goes in an average, but we feel very safe to tell our patients and to tell our members that it's good to go to the dentist and it's important to see the dentist to keep our health. The conclusion here, as I said, uh, the adherence is high up to the PPE. We know that you can deliver safe uh, uh, treatment to your, your patients. And we still continue to see a much lower level of COVID-19 among dentists when compared to other, other uh, professionals. Uh, we're still using some of this data to look into now dentists as vaccinator. A lot of states, I think everybody now and throughout the 
federal mandate, can vaccinate, you just need to be treated. I think we're expanding this. And there is other things. We focus on COVID now. We want to take advantage of the learnings from COVID to make sure that dentists also vaccinate for other things, including HPV, the flu, and other things. With that, I'm going to stop here. I'm going to thank you for having me here. This is the email for science, the Science Institute. There is also my personal email. And you guys are so close. Make sure that if you come to Chicago, come and stop by to visit. OK, thank you. And we answer any questions that you may have, if we have time. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Araujo and Dr. Duarte for that stimulating discussion. This will be sort of an interacting webinar. So if our participants or audience have any questions, please feel free to type them in the chat and either myself or Dr. Duarte can definitely take a look at the chat and we will go from there. And I believe Dr. Duarte has some questions that she has prepared beforehand. Um, so we'll wait a couple of minutes for the audience to type in their questions. Um, if not, we can go ahead and get started with questions prepared by Dr. Duarte. Thank you. Thank you, Drashti. Thank you, Dr. Araujo. It's a, it was a brilliant uh, presentation as I thought it would be. When we think about uh, COVID and all the treatments and vaccine and the record time, so it's not really a question, but I wanted to ask you if you could give us an idea of how that compare to every other disease, because now we are kind of learning things as we go, right? So we are learning how to treat, how to prevent as we go. So in terms of timetable, because that's sometimes I think it's hard for people to understand how fast we got there, but at the same time, is it safe? So if you can just uh, elaborate a little bit when you compare, for example, to other like HPV that you know uh, you mentioned. Yeah, thank you for the question. Before I answer, I just want to ask, um, have time to also thank the dean for uh, allowing me to speak to your school. It's a pleasure for me to do this. It's the first time that I'm speaking to Indiana. So thank you, Dimmer Dawkins, for, for having me here. Thank you. Um, so in terms of the infection and the timing, Simone, I think it's uh, the difference here is how this disease is contaminated, is the, is the passing from person to person, right? And I think it's so, as you said, it's the unknown is so big compared to the no of other virus infections such as HPV. We don't know how fast it was spread at the beginning. We didn't know how it would spread. We were all cleaning our bananas coming from the grocery store. We we're all cleaning everything. We wouldn't touch anything. We now know it's science coming up. That is, um, but it's most important is it's still something very contagious. And I think what we've seen lately is that the more that we keep the social distance, the more we still keep the people uh, safe through you wearing masks and other things, the better it is. The question here is now about the variants. What it is, it, are we over? And I just heard Dr. Uh, Fauci talking lately. We're not over, we shouldn't be celebrating because we don't know, we don't wanna get to what it is that we see in other countries, including back home in Brazil, where these variants are coming up. The important thing about vaccination is that we are able to stop the infection and get to herd immunity and get to a point uh, to, that we can then go back to whatever normalcy it is. Um, in terms of other virus, as I said, one of the things we know is that we get a flu shot every year. And I expect from the research that I read and everything is that this is going to be the case from now on. We don't know if us, who we are being fully vaccinated, are able to transmit to other things. So there's so much unknown. And that's why we're focusing really on the safety in the dental setting, because we wanna make sure that people who are comfortable to come back, they come back to the dentist. We know that 20% by the data from Marco Vujicic, 20% of the, of the population in the US, they do not wanna go to the dentist until they know that everybody has been vaccinated. So I think we need to still be uh, careful with what we do to make sure that prevention comes first, but then we ensure our patients. Because if we don't see them, they're going to come up with all the problems in their own health. And that's what we don't want. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's 
kind of yes like yes you did okay Thank you. so we have a few questions here in the chat uh one for dr gregory from dr gregory do you have any update data on covid incidents so uh, we, as I showed you, thank you for the question. As I showed you, so this data that we have uh, will be publishing, I think it's coming in June. We continue to look into uh, in a monthly basis and it hasn't changed. I would say that average is still, incidence is still among dentists below 1%. Same with hy hygienists, we've seen uh, a small percentage of uh, new cases among hygienists every month. We will continue our work until we get to 12 months and then go from there. But we're starting to ask some questions about vaccination. Thank you. We have another one from Dr. Ramito. When we think about the phase out of amalgam, what do you believe will replace this material in terms of cost and durability, particularly for those with aging existing amalgams that cannot afford crowns? Yeah, thank you, Laura, and thank you for all the work you also have been doing with CSA. I know you you help us a lot. Um, so this is the main point, I think, in terms of amalgam. What is the issue here? It's not the thing. Do we have something that can uh, substitute? I don't think we have something that is as good as amalgam. I, I haven't heard of a resin composite that has shown same level of uh, efficacy in terms of in terms of closing that those gaps as amalgam has at least from what I have read. So when uh, Dr. Platt and I and Dr. Lipman wrote some commentary to Jada a few years ago, it was because this is one of the main questions, Laura, that people have outside of the U.S. If you think about countries in Africa and Asia, they cannot substitute amalgam yet because they cannot afford to provide something that is as good. You know, durability, gold will be great, but the cost is high. We don't know also the, the level. That, and when you talk about cost, we're not talking about cost just of the materials when you buy. It's also cost of the treatment. It becomes more cost effective to use amalgam in an area where you don't have electricity and other things. So we're be doing a big work on, um, in, with UNAP and WHO with, uh, uh, in the Minamata Convention and hopefully to slow down the phase out as much as we can. Dr. Platt is involved and I think he will be able to answer a lot of questions for you guys later on because of the work with FTI. Thank you again. Perfect. Uh, now from Dr. Tunkan first, she's uh, saying you did a great presentation. And then she's asking, in your opinion, what is the role of telehealth in dentistry? And also, if you think that dentists would adopt telehealth because we cannot do procedures. I, I don't think teledentistry is something that will substitute dentistry, right? You can't, right? We can't do that. But I think it's a screening tool. Yeah, it's a screening tool. It's very important, but also the a way also to do some diagnosis. You know, I know a lot of people. We talk a little about it with the oropathologists. We talk with radiologists, and uh, one of the things that we have to remember, we're talking a lot about health equity. You're going to hear this term a lot, especially under the new federal, uh, you know, government. Health equity is not just making everything equal, but also making sure that everybody has the level of treatment that they can afford and they need. So teledentistry also brings the point of health equity because if I'm in the middle of nowhere in the country where you don't have uh, access to a dentist right away and you have a toothache and you have a different type of emergency, you can always contact someone. And that will be the first piece of the treatment. So there is a call code now for teledentistry. So we are, we are making efforts to improve that. Thank you. That's great. Now from Dr. Stewart, of the 2,195 dentists sampled, 2.6% were found to be positive for COVID-19. Was the mode of transmission identified did they contract COVID in the dental setting or in a non-dental setting? Thank you for the question. So 2.6% is still a very small number. If you talk about the number of people that are in the survey, 
out of all of them, two identified the infection as being in the dental office. The majority, the vast majority were not, that wasn't positive, was not in the dental office. Um, so that's the record we have. Um, CDC last week re, uh, released some data in terms of contagion of uh, prison in a prison um, environment in Utah in September, and they talked about the infection in a dental setting, but we didn't see this being in a problem because in September we didn't know much. So that's where it is. So we still think that there is a possibility, but I think that's why we're pushing so much for vaccination. Perfect. Uh, Dean Mordecai Quink has a question that goes the same line. Have there been any confirmed cases of COVID transmitted in the dental setting to patients? Is there any research being done to ensure we're doing all we can to prevent transmission through the air from one patient to another? Yeah, thank you, Dean, for the question. I think that, as I said, there was the one we know, this case last that reported by the CDC and the MMWR, and I'll send this to the group of the publication later on, um, is the very the only one that we've seen published besides what we report in our study. Uh, we are looking to continue looking to what are the dentists are doing in terms of creating barriers and creating a safe environment for the patients, but also going back to looking to what else can we do? Is pre-procedure rinsing something that is important or not? At first, we are not recommending, but we see more and more evidence coming out. And I think the great thing is that there was so much effort put in by companies and by researchers on prevention, which for me, I love. I'm a prevention-based person, uh, that we will see more data coming out uh, in the next couple of months. Excellent. Now from Dr. Bruzzaniti, can you speculate on why there was such a difference in COVID positivity between healthcare workers, which is 11%, and dentist cumulative exposure, which is 2.6%? Yes, sure. Thanks for the question. The, the, the data that was published um, showing 11% is a public, it's a data, the larger cohort of healthcare professionals and includes. Um, physicians, nurse, nurse practitioners, physician assistants in New York City and in the UK. So it's a lot of people from two different countries. And as you remember from last year, New York was the center of the epidemic for a long time. And that's why you see that high level of uh, healthcare people exposed. And a lot of these healthcare workers were frontline healthcare workers. So they were directly working with the patients in the in the, in the hospital setting. So that's why we see the big difference between the two. While the us, we took a step back and we were very selective on who we will see or not. Great, thank you. We have a question from Dr. Hadil. First, thank you doctor for the presentation. When you mentioned Dr. Gopal's work, microbiology and chemistry, the slides state tennis fluoride uptake in biofilm versus available fluoride measurements. Mm -hmm. Could you elaborate on this point a little more? Well, uh, that's hard when you put me on spot here, knowing that probably Dr. Zero and his group are all here and Dr. Duarte also here. So it wasn't me. <laughs> no, but that's a tough question for me. So, uh, so this is uh, what we're looking to, fluoride uptake is very important because we know now that a lot of manufacturers are coming up with stainless fluorides. It's no longer just one manufacturer. So we need to understand if there is the standard being used for that to measure the uptake is there or it needs to be updated because of the new formulas. So that's one of the cases why we're looking to uptake on the biofilm. And because of all the hypotheses that we see that, you know, the change in biofilm happens because of fluoride presence. Apologies for my dog. Uh, he's yawning here this morning. So what we talk, what we're doing here is that how do we measure fluoride in the mouth, not just on the biofilm, but also on the whole uh, available on the saliva, available on the environment. So I promise that I can get more information from Perna, but looking to the work that we're going to publish in IADR this year as an abstract and her group will be there. Perfect, you did well. <laughs> So one last question from Dr. Sponek. 
Uh, some universities are requiring their students to be vaccinated prior to returning to school in the fall. Do you think dental schools should adopt this policy? I think it's up to each school to decide what they have to do. Is uh, I think it's a decision that will be made, I bet, with the dean and the others in the school and what is the best thing and how to be safe for not just the students, the instructors, professors, the staff, as well as the patients, because you think about a lot of patients who choose not to be vaccinated, other people who choose not to be vaccinated. Um, so I don't know if I have a specific position on this. Ad. I think it's each dental school will have to see what they need to do and understand the legal implications and regulatory implications before they make that decision. Perfect. Thank you so much. I think we're done with the questions in the chat. And I can't thank you enough for the time and this beautiful presentation. I am sure we'll be talking about you for months to come at school. So thank you so much. No, thank you, uh, you, Simone, for the invitation. Uh, thank you for the organizers, Bach, and Doc, and also to the to the dean. Um, Murdoch Hinch, thank you so much. I uh, hope I can come to the school sometime soon. I know Jeff had talked about, so thank you. Yes, that, that is for sure something yeah. we will we'll be committed to do. Yeah, and I hope we continue this partnership, you know, not just me. I know also, don't forget Sabrina that has won an award, the 3M award. So still, you know, we, we partner a lot with you guys. So hopefully this is going to continue uh, to be strong and, you know, take advantage of the closeness that we have. So thank yeah, you so but, much. And we'll, we can have a puppy play day because there are plenty of puppies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank, thank you, you so, so much. much. Thank have you. Have a great day and then, uh, thank you again. Bye-bye. Yes, thank you, Dr. Duarte again. And thank you, Dr. Arahujo for taking the time of your afternoon to come and talk to us. Um, earlier this afternoon, you know, I mixed the two unconventional fields of Shakespeare and science together to shake things up a little bit around our research day hosting. So having you come and speak to us, I really hope that some of us students as well as other scholars in the building are able to take away ideas to start up their own research. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, the moment you've been waiting for. Here come awards! Make sure to grab your lab coats and your safety goggles because the brilliance of these scholars will surely leave a splash on you. And with that punny ending to my spiel, I would like to welcome Dr. Murdoch Kinch to introduce our first set of award winners. Thank you, Joshi. The first award is a 2021 IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association Distinguished Faculty Award for Research. This year's awardee has had an extensive and illustrious career as a researcher. She received her Bachelor's of Dental Surgery from the Government Dental College, University of Kerala, India in 1990 and followed this with an MS in Biomedical Informatics from the University of Pittsburgh in 2006. Subsequently, she received her DMD and PhD from the University of Pittsburgh in 2010 and 2012, respectively. Following her training, she held several, several positions at the University of Pittsburgh before receiving a joint appointment in 2013 with the Regan Street Institute located in Indianapolis, Indiana, as an affiliate research scientist and in the Department of Cariology, Operative Dentistry, and Dental Public Health of IU School of Dentistry. Currently, she holds a dual faculty position at IUSD and the Regan Street Institute as an associate professor and director of dental informatics and she is the founding director of the Joint Dental Informatics Program. Dr. Philakakath's primary research focus is developing means for leveraging electronic health record data for clinical research and quality improvement processes, designing clinical systems that better support clinicians' decision-making processes, implementing and evaluating 
clinical decision support systems, and facilitating health information exchange to promote care coordination between medical and dental care providers. Dr. Tiva, Tiva Likakath's interests have led her to numerous publications, winning her widespread recognition as a leader in the field of dental informatics. Dr. Tiva Likakath has been successful in eliciting extensive research funding with a total of nine research projects completed since 2009. Currently, she is the principal investigator for three multi-year projects for sponsors in both the private and public sectors, including the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. Although busy with her own research, she has also taken time to serve as a research co-mentor or mentor to numerous dental and graduate students at IU School of Dentistry. She has served on various committees at the Indiana University School of Dentistry related to research, quality assurance, curriculum development, and service to the professional community. All aspects of Dr. Tivalikaka's career thus far have been exemplary, and it is our hope that this award reflects the IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association's high regard for her achievements. Let me be the first to congratulate the winner of the 2021 IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association Distinguished Faculty Award for Research, Dr. Tankam Tivalikakath. Congratulations. The second, <laughs> the second award is the 2021 IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association Distinguished Faculty Award for Teaching. The IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association Distinguished Faculty Award for Teaching recipient is selected each year by the awards recipients from the three previous years. The previous recipients review the CVs and faculty annual reviews of each nominee and then select an individual for the award based on their accomplishments. This year's IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association Distinguished Faculty Award for Teaching awardee graduated from IU School of Dentistry with highest honors in 1978. Following graduation, this individual had a distinguished career as a full-time private practitioner in Pendleton, Indiana. In 2013, this individual transitioned to full-time academia by joining the School of Dentistry as an assistant clinical professor in comprehensive care and general dentistry. Since then, this faculty member has worn many hats, first as a team clinic director, then as the emergency clinic director, and finally as a comprehensive care clinic director. Additional career achievements include earning fellowship status in the Academy of General Dentistry, fellowship status in the International College of Dentists, and serving as the past president of the Madison County Dental Society. This faculty member is widely hailed by both students and faculty for a tireless dedication to enriching our students' educational experiences by showing them real world clinical applications of the theories that they learn in the classroom. As such, this faculty member provides immeasurable instruction and mentoring to our students, which puts them in a position to develop their critical thinking problem solving and decision making skills. At the same time, this individual is an active member of the Christian Students Dental Association, CBDE Preceptor Credential and Calibration Task Force, the IU School of Dentistry Admissions Committee, and the DDS Curriculum and Assessment Committee. Without further ado, please join me in giving hearty congratulations to this year's IU School of Dentistry Alumni Association Distinguished Faculty Award for Teaching recipient, Dr. Daniel S. Bennett. Congratulations, Dr. Bennett.
Our next award is the Indiana AADR Research Staff Award. The recipient of this award is nominated and voted by the Indiana AADR officers. I'm pleased to announce that the recipient of the 2021 Indiana AADR Research Staff Award is Ms. Cheryl McGinnis. Congratulations. The next award is the Dean's Award for Research Excellence. This award is presented annually to a senior dental student who has displayed outstanding achievement in dental research over multiple years. The recipient of this award is a student who has been involved in original research and has demonstrated her ability to think critically, assimilate and synthesize the work of others and to state and defend research hypotheses through both oral and written communication of her selected area of research. In addition, the recipient of this award has demonstrated high academic achievement in dental school with, in particular, outstanding achievements in the basic science courses and has displayed an interest in furthering of public understanding of research and education in oral biology through research scholarship. Congratulations go to Ms. Sydney Twiggs as a recipient of the 2021 Dean's Award for Research Excellence. And now the next group of awards. Thank you. Thank you. I forget my microphone. Thank you, the Dean, for uh, for the first group of the Prime Award. Doesn't mean that the race is not important, but that's all a Prime Award from the Dean. So what uh, what we want to do next is we're going to do a sponsor. We have the support. Lots of this event we be we cannot be happy without the support from um, lots of cool sponsor. So we have some message from the sponsor for about two minutes for you. Crest and Oral-B, dental professionals inspire us. And as the world continues to change, they continue to inspire us with their dedication to their patients and communities. That's why we're supporting dental professionals with resources that help them to grow professionally and promote healthy smiles. We're offering free live online education, ways to connect with patients while they maintain their oral health at home, free products to aid in local relief efforts, and a path for the industry's future. We're all in this together, and together we will make it through. Thank you. So next category of the award, we would like to introduce Dr. Brusanetti to announce the award for the next category. Hello everyone. My name is Dr. Angela Brusanetti and I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Biomedical Sciences and Comprehensive Care. And I'm also the Director of Dental Student Research. And for those of you who have perhaps not yet started research, feel free to reach out to me um, if you would like to know how to become engaged, how to find a research mentor, and the requirements and opportunities that are available for you to do research beginning in first year, but right through dental school. So one of the most enjoyable aspects of my role as Director of Dental Student Research 
is that I have the opportunity to also announce the recipients of student research awards and research honours. And these are awards that go to our graduating D4 class. And it's a culmination of several years of research for our students. The first award I would like to announce are the recipients of the 2021 Research Honours Awards. This is a certificate of achievements for outstanding student researchers. The Research Honours recognises um, student researchers that have shown sustained dedication to dental research throughout dental school. These recipients have met and exceeded several rigorous milestones, including having conducted substantial research, having participated and presented their research findings at our student research presentations program. They have presented their research at IUS Research Day and received research fellowships funded by IUSD, have presented their research also at national and international meetings such as AADR and IADR. And the students must have also demonstrated other scholarly activity, including research manuscript submissions for publications in a scientific journal. Because of the time commitment required for this program, only a few students achieve research honours. This year, however, I'm very happy to say we have two recipients. So without further ado, I'm pleased to announce the recipients of research honours for 2021 are Rebecca Schembarger and Sydney Twiggs. Congratulations to you both. Our next research award is our most prestigious. It's the Cyril Carr Research Scholarship Award. This scholarship goes to a D4 DDS or IDP student who has been engaged in high quality research in any field of dentistry with a special emphasis on research conducted over multiple years. As this is the one of most prestigious awards, it is also comes with a substantial financial gift. The award recipient is chosen based on submitted nomination letters from their mentors and, and they have, must have met several other milestones which are similar to those in research honours. The winner is selected by majority vote of the Graduate Research Committee. Although we have many students who do outstanding research, this year two students rose to the top and due to their outstanding achievements, the committee decided to award two scholarships this year. So I'm very happy to announce the recipients of the Cyril Carr Research Scholarship Award goes to both Sydney Twiggs and Rebecca Schembarker. Please join me in congratulating both Sydney and Rebecca for receiving both the Cyril Carr Research Scholarship as well as Research Honours Certificates. In closing, I would like to thank and recognise all of our dental student researchers and their faculty mentors for their exceptional professionalism and dedication to evidence-based dentistry. I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Bruce Nitti. So next award is going, the category of the award will be presentation of the research mm -hmm. award. So the Distinguished Research Faculty Travel Award this year the winner is Dr. Angela Brusaniti. So next, Elizabeth Huge Dental Hygiene Case Report Award. The honor, the honorable mention is Ta Sang and Deborah Gregory. And the winner of the Dental Hygiene Case Report Award are Lindsay Owen and Yelena Fox. Next, Indiana Section of American Association for Dental Research, the Undergrad Student Award. The winner is Olivia Hensdale. The effect of colorine osteocyte apoptosis and bone mass. Next, American Association for Dental Research, Student Research Day Award. The winner is Marcus Leviton, time point optimization for bone resorption analysis in mouth ligature induced periodontitis. Next, American Association for Dental Research, Densply Sirona Student Award for Advancing Dental Research and its Application. The winner is Mickey Haramillo, ACE2 expression in symptomatic COVID-19 patients. Next, 
Indiana Dental Association Student Research Award. The winner is Sydney Twix, Dental Alveolar Change in Class 2 Division 2 Patient Using Point 018 Appliance. Next award, King Saad University Travel Award for Excellence in Preventive Oral Healthcare. The winner for this year is Rebecca Schamberger, P53 in Predicting Progression of Potentially Malignant Oral Epithelial Lesions. Next award, Indiana Section of the American Association for Dental Research, Pre-Doctoral Case Report Award. The winner this year, Rasik Welges, Application of CO2 Laser for Maxillary Labial Phrenectomy and Vestibuloplasty. Next award, Delta Dental Award for Innovation in Oral Care Research. Co-winner. The first co-winner is Dr. Catherine Ferry, Evaluation of Soft Tissue Thickness, Measurement Accuracy, Three Different Methodology. Another co-winner for this award is Dr. Casey Ryan's Radiation of CBCT and Traditional Orthodontics Imaging Utilizing Pediatric Phantom. Next award. King Saad University Travel Award for the best clinical case report. We have co-winner again. The, the first one is Chani Batra, minimally invasive surgical technique for regenerative therapy of intra bony defect. And Dr. Takahiro Fuji, correction of gummy smile with the lip repositioning procedure, a case report. Next award, King Saudi University PhD Student Travel Award. The winner this year is Dr. Gina Casablanco Rubio, Dietary Factor Affecting Urinary Fluoride During Pregnancy in Mexican Women. The last award is Men at Highs Award for Excellent in Dental Research. So the winner this year is Dr. Alice and Alcorn Longitudinal in Vitro Effective of Silver Diamine Fluoride on Early Enamel Caries Lesion. And please visit all their poster, you know, in the third floor and the first floor. And as I mentioned earlier, if you scan the QR code, you will see those pre the presentation from those winner of this award, including the person who do not compete in the award too. Rashni. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasuk, and for all the other uh, panelists who introduced our winners and congratulations to all of our winners. I know that as a second year dental student, I'm already so inspired by all of my seniors, graduates and staff of doing research in plethora of avenues. So to give you a bit more idea of what else has been happening as a student perspective on research, we have prepared a short video to showcase just how important and essential research is at IUSD. Hi, my name is Ashley Karczewski and I'm a third year here at IUSD and I'm currently the Vice President-Elect of the American Association of Dental Research's National Student Research Group. I got interested in, dentist, in dental research because um, I had a family friend at the time who was a researcher at University of Alabama, Birmingham. He invited me down there and I got to spend the day uh, shadowing him and following him around. And then he said, oh, I can set you up with Dr. Votino up at IUSD. Um, since I was really interested in the research aspect of dentistry. For 2019 and 2020, I actually took a gap year and did a fellowship through the NIH. Um, so I was the first dental student Fogarty Fellow from the U.S. And I lived in Kenya 
for eight months where I was joining a project called CHAMP, which is Children's HIV Oral Manifestations Project. Um, I was selected as a Fogarty uh, scholar because I had an extensive history of research um, with many publications through dental materials. And when I was in the summer between first and second year of dental school, Dr. Simone Duarte, she actually took me with her for the summer to Brazil. And I did a public health and dental materials research internship at the um, University of Ceará in Fortaleza, Brazil. So that is where I initially got my interest in public health dentistry. So right now um, I am finishing up my Fogarty Fellowship because of COVID, we are some delays in shipping of samples. So I'm finishing up my Fogarty Fellowship while also being engaged here at the Dental Materials Lab. And we are working on um, chlorhexidine impregnated adhesives. We are currently incorporating um, chlorhexidine into nanotubes. So that way it would be released in a, a karyogenic environment. Um, so that way we have anti-caries action happening when, when it's needed, um, and mostly in patients who are in a public health setting and don't have as much access to the dentist. For me, I love the collaboration. Um, I've been very fortunate to be able to collaborate with people, especially from Brazil um, and also now in Kenya and all around the world really. Um, so that's been something that I've enjoyed is coming up with projects, from different perspectives. And I've, I've also been very fortunate to have um, been able to travel to London for IADR, uh, to Kenya for my fellowship, and Brazil for another internship. So to me, I've, my world has only expanded through research. And I love collaborating um, with people and being on the cutting edge of dentistry and always looking towards the future and pushing new products and techniques um, in order to benefit the patient. So if you're interested in getting started in research, I would highly recommend either reaching out to myself um, or Dr. Bruzaniti because we have a student research group here at the school and we're always looking for more people to come and join us. Um, there's always somewhere, there's always a lab that's willing to take a student to help. Dr. Gregory's lab is always really great for basic science research and he's interested in uh, more microbiology um, based projects. And here in Dr. Feitosa Sohaki's lab, we do a lot of really cool dental materials and she's been the best mentor for me. So it's really important as a clinician to have experience in research and research methodologies in order to understand literature that's coming out and to be able to best serve your patients um, with the most current technologies and techniques. So I really encourage anyone who's interested even a little bit to try to get involved in research. You won't regret it. I'm Beatriz Panariello. I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at Indian University School of Dentistry, and my area of research is in oral biofilms, and also I focus on therapies to control and prevent these biofilms. So since I was a kid, I was interested in research. I used to love my science classes, biology, microbiology, genetics, human health. I remember that every time I watched the news and I saw researchers doing research and discovering new things, I got super excited and I said, oh, this is what I want to do. So when I was in the second year of dental school, I started doing research. So my favorite aspect of being involved in research is that I can apply theoretical research to solve dental health problems. And also I want to be involved not only on research, but also in the legacy of dental research. So I'm working uh, in a lot of projects with different uh, dental fields. So I work with cariology, caries research, also periodontal research, endodontics, and implant research. Uh, right now we have an NIH project. So we are studying low temperature plasma to control perimplantitis biofilms. So uh, when you have an implant, there is a high possibility that you will have a formation of biofilm because of bacteria related to 
periodontal pathogenic biofilms. So these bacteria, they can uh, cause a problem in your guns and also in the bones. So we should uh, control and prevent the formation of these biofilms. So we use this low temperature plasma, which is uh, kind of a new technology when you use uh, an argon gas and also a machine that converts this gas to a plasma, which is the fourth state of the matter. And when you have this plasma machine, you can um, apply this plasma to the, to the implants and this plasma removes the biofilm very, very well. Well, research took me to different places in the world. I was able to connect with different people from different areas of research, from different countries. Uh, I was able to teach many students, American students, also foreign students. I came to, from Brazil, so I had a research experience there. And because of research, I'm here today. So I really want to encourage people, especially women, <laughs> to, to do research because we can, we can go super far when we are doing what we love. And also we will leave a legacy in the dental research field. So this is what makes me motivated, what keeps me motivated to keep doing research. So if someone is interested in research, the first step is to get to know what makes you interested in uh, what fields do you like. So you can talk to a faculty member, research what they're doing, their ongoing researches, and then you can also talk to them and ask them if you can volunteer to do research with them. This is a very good first step. My name is Drashti Modi. I am currently a second year dental student at Indiana University School of Dentistry. I am originally from India. We immigrated in 2011 to Virginia, and I have been in Richmond, Virginia ever since 2011 until 2019 uh, when I moved to Indy to start dental school. And the way I got involved in research was really through my undergrad training. Uh, my undergrad training is in microbial ecology research, which is something a little different for a pre-health student, but I was trained in a strong belief that wherever there's life, there's ecology, and whenever there's ecology, there's adaptation, and that has carried through into my dental research because now I do research in the Department of Cariology um, and Public Health at the dental school. And my research is primarily based on looking at adaptations of bacterial biofilms and multi-species biofilms in um, different environment stressors. So research in general, I think I was seven years old when my grandfather gave me a very like toy version of microscope and we were looking at plant samples that we were planting in the garden that summer. So ever since then, um, he planted this seed, pun intended, uh, in my head of looking at little things or the details of little things and how they play a big role in the final picture of something that's in your hand. So ever since 8-7, I have been relentless in pursuit of understanding the little details of all the problems and then understanding those details, figuring out solutions and creative ways to help solve the problems. And in dental school, research is the gateway for me to not only enhance my current knowledge of dentistry, but also figure out how does this current knowledge work in a multidiscipline setting? So how something that I'm looking up for a dental perspective could teach me two or three things about medicine or pharmacology or any other fields? And how do they all play in role of our patient care? My favorite part about being in research is just what I explained earlier, is that if I start looking up one question, usually at the end of my search, I have maybe answered three, four, five questions. And that's, I think, what is the most dynamic and the most amazing area of research or the aspect of research is simply the fact that you might think you want to know one thing, but you walk away learning three or four different things. And then you're just more curious and more curious the next time you approach it.
being engaged in research, I have been able to present in various settings, not only just in person, but also submit proposals. So last year, I was able to work with another faculty at the school and submit a grant for um, getting funding for patients who are survivors of domestic violence um, in our student clinics. This year, the biggest crowning stone per se of my research achievements is I applied and I got accepted to an NIH fellowship. It's called the Medical Research Scholars Program. So I will be attending um, a year-long fellowship in Bethesda, Maryland, starting June of this year until next year um, in hopes of, again, just pursuing my current research in dentistry, but also participating in various networking events and various continuing education classes just to see what research has in store for me in future and what I can bring back in terms of that cross-disciplinary approach. Um, and I do like the in-person and the communicative aspect of research because one of the most exciting things or one of the things that I do want to make it a core of my dental career is bridging the gap between science and societies. So how do I, as a physician scientist in making, can help my community or various communities understand and trust science in their own way? So I do want to come back as a physician scientist, work in academia, and hopefully have a research lab of my own. <laughs> So my current research um, is on two different projects. So right now I'm working with my postdoctoral uh, faculty mentor here in my current lab on a project that is looking at using plasma gas uh, to treat peri-implantitis or the biofilms that cause peri-implantitis. Um, that's one of the projects we're working on. The other project that is my uh, funded fellowship through school is looking at calibrating a biosensor to sense for pH and calcium changes um, that mimic karyogenic processes. So our goal is that if we get this biosensor calibrated to give us real time changes in pH levels and calcium levels on a tube surface. Um, hopefully in the future, we might apply this biosensor in um, a less privileged community or community who don't have regular access to dental professionals um, and sort of be on the preventive side of dentistry Whereas we use these readings to predict how the caries disease is going to progress in that individual and then personalize the treatment according to that data. So that's two of the projects that I'm working on right now. So one of the things I always like to say to anybody who is interested in research is it is just an email or, hey, I'm interested in research, tell me more, phrase away. And here at IU School of Dentistry, we have a lot of different opportunities for student researchers who might want to you know, test waters in research or for somebody like me who knew that the research is going to be a major part of my academic career, and I already know I want research to be integrated in it, we have avenues for both of these mindsets. For people who definitely know the area um, of the research that they want to go into, or already have a project in mind that they just want to start, hit the ground running, um, reach out to the mentor or anybody, any faculty who's in that area of practice. Uh, for me, I reached out to faculty who were working on microbiology or who were working in public health, because those are the two areas two areas of interest for me. If somebody is interested in tissue regeneration or more on the eukaryotic side of things, uh, there are lots of faculty who are very eagerly waiting for exciting students like you to come in and help them carry the dental research legacy on. Uh, one thing I would add in the end is simply that I know that as dental students, our schedules are booked even before we know that our schedules are booked. Um, and sometimes research does seem daunting because you don't get immediate results, which is completely contradictory of what we learn in dentistry. You know, a lot of the times people come to dentistry over medicine is simply that, you know, you see that more patient interaction, you see the immediate results of your treatment plan, and you get to build that bond with patient over time. In research, you still get to do all of those things. You still get to build a bond with patient. You still get to see the results of your hard work. It just takes a little bit more time and patience. So if you are somebody who's like me and are just very curious to know, why are we doing the things we're doing in dentistry and how do we make them better? 
I think research is a great avenue to just engage while you're in dental school, um, but also something that you might want to keep engaged or you know keep getting involved in once you graduate. So definitely do think about making research a part of your dental school experience. Hi, my name is Rebecca Schumberger. I'm a fourth year dental student. I currently do research with Dr. Santosh and our research is on oral epithelial dysplasia and predicting which lesions will progress or not into oral squamous cell carcinoma. So when entering dental school, I was really drawn toward the topic of oral cancer and I somehow wanted to get involved with that topic outside of the typical didactic learning aspect of it. So I knew that Dr. Santosh was also doing a project on that topic. So that's when I reached out to her and got involved that way. Currently, we're doing a continuation of our previous project, but our previous project was basically determining the role of the protein cornulin and how it could aid in predicting whether or not an oral epithelial dysplasia lesion will progress into oral squamous cell carcinoma or not. And now at this point, we're looking towards P53 and also utilizing it in the same way in order to make that same prediction. So the end result is basically that you would be able to biopsy a lesion, assess those potential biomarkers, and basically be able to predict whether or not a lesion is high risk for malignant transformation or not. And then that'll aid in performing the proper treatment for the patient, whether it means complete excision of a lesion or a little bit more conservative where you would maybe do something else along those lines. The topic of oral cancer um, was of interest to me prior to dental school, but then upon taking our oral pathology course, uh, I was that much more interested in it. So by doing research, I know that I could learn more about it and then also contribute toward the research toward oral cancer. I really enjoy working one-on-one -on -one with a mentor who, in my case, uh, my mentor is Dr. Nitha Santosh, and you can just learn a lot from um, individuals who have trained in that area longer than you have. So it's a mentorship and then also a way to learn more and also get involved to contributing toward the field of research. I really believe and I really think that the research uh, department here at IUSD is great, and I think they're really uh, open for students getting involved and you can pretty much um, get involved in many different ways and contribute toward the field of research. And what's great about that is that, you know, any project you do, you're contributing information to research and science in helping uh, both those fields be more progressive. So yeah, if you're a student and you're interested in research, first determine what aspect of research you're interested in, uh, such as figuring out what topic really interests you. And then at that point, look up uh, different faculty members or different professors that may be doing research in that area. Reach out to them, try to connect with them, see how you can get involved and play a part in that project. And that's my best advice for getting involved in research here at IUSD. All right, thank you. So before the meeting is adjourned, I would like to thank uh, all the research day organizing committee and, and especially all our supporting staff, you know, uh, Kelly, Sheryl, Nicole, Terry, Caleb, and all the illustration team to make this live event happen. Thank you, the guest speaker. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Duarte for introducing um, the guest speaker, thank you, the Dean, thank you everyone for the support for the live event of the Re research day today. Thank you. And please make sure to go check out all of the student research posters in the main street hallway and the third floor. Use the QR code that Terry developed so you can hear our beautiful voices one more time. And thank you all very much for joining us this afternoon. Be well. Thank you.